I'm going to invite you to be seated because I'm going to give us a little background before we read and it will get to be a long stand and I just don't want your attention to wander even for a minute. In fact, I was checking out of the grocery store and one of our members was behind me and noticed the three box of Kleenex and said, oh, Pastor Chris, are you going to move us to tears this weekend? <laughs> and I assured him that I move myself to tears every time I prepare a sermon. So before we read this morning's gospel, I want to take a minute to reflect on how familiar some Bible passages are and how by their familiarity they come to mean certain things to us. We find that we can quote them and put them on posters and on greeting cards. But when we slow down long enough to really pay attention, these familiar verses become richer and more comforting and more challenging than that familiarity might offer. The Beatitudes, which are this morning's gospel readings, are an excellent case in point. At the beginning of this reading, my Bible, like many of yours, adds a heading that reads, The Beatitudes. But that word isn't in the Bible. It's not in the original text. In fact, it's a term that wasn't even coined until the 16th century. But it's a great example of language that we accept as biblically normative when it isn't even biblical language at all. Nevertheless, many of us can quote at least a line or two of the Beatitudes, and we draw comfort from them. But if we read them apart from their context, their power to comfort and their power to call are actually diluted. So today we're going to dig deep and discover the gift that lies buried beneath these familiar words. If you were here last week, you will recall that Jesus had just emerged into public ministry, and I didn't mean to shame you if you're not last, weren't here last week. I'll catch you up. Um, Jesus had just emerged into public ministry, calling for repentance, a turning for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And then he went walk about and called to his side folks very unlikely to be found in a king's entourage fishermen. And he told them that he would make them fish for people, and then he took them on a fishing tour of the kingdom. Matthew 4 reads, Jesus then went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all the sick, those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, and paralytics, and he cured them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Jesus begins his ministry by announcing that the kingdom of heaven has come near and then shows what the kingdom looks like by walking the shiny new disciples through the shadow lands where God's most vulnerable people dwell, bringing light and wholeness and hope. That's the background for Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which begins with what we call the Beatitudes. So from Matthew 5. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. 
Jesus, having gathered a great crowd to himself, goes up a mountain, and we know from the end of chapter 7 that it's not just the disciples who are listening, it's a great crowd who listen as he now casts a vision for the kingdom with nine blessing statements and then goes on immediately to teach about evangelism, service, anger, adultery, divorce, revenge, enemies, stewardship, prayer, worry, fruitfulness, self-deception, and more. The Sermon on the Mount is a really long sermon. It's more than 12 minutes. This long teaching, which astonishes the crowds, begins with the blessings that will set the stage for the entirety of Matthew's gospel. These reassuring blessings bring great comfort to the hearers then and now, and they should. But in context, they cast a vision for the kingdom of heaven, and they do so with deeper comfort and more disruptive power than we can imagine. Do you remember the uneasy gift of life, light from last week? These blessings bring balm and they bring disruption, which is appropriate coming from a God who calls for repentance, a turning and upending of business as usual. Followed by a great crowd, Jesus goes up a mountain. Although these, although these are not big mountains, people who have been to the Holy Land will tell you you can see for miles in every direction. From this mountaintop, you can see the shadowlands and the lakeside and the seats of power. Jesus speaks from the vantage point of the worldly reality of the people who have gathered to listen. And it's critically important that we remember that Jesus is speaking to those who live under a cruelly oppressive imperial rule. This imperial rule has its own hierarchy, and those to whom Jesus is speaking are at the bottom. These are folks who find no blessing in the current kingdom. And he says to them, blessed are you. Some Bibles translate this as happy are you. Satisfied are you. But some scholars argue for another translation of the Greek that maybe better captures just what Jesus is trying to impart about this disruptive new kingdom. And it would sound something like this. In the kingdom of heaven, enviable will be the poor because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Enviable will be those who mourn for they will be comforted. As Jesus and the people look across the countryside, they see those in power, those who live in comfort and status, those who are envied, those who are looked up to. And Jesus is telling the gathered masses that the kingdom of heaven, not a someday kingdom, the kingdom Jesus is bringing is going to be different. The social, religious, and political order will be turned on its head And those pressed under the weight of other people's privilege will be lifted up to a higher place, an enviable place. Blessed, enviable will be the poor. From the shadow lands into the light, blessed are you. What's more, Jesus is speaking both to those with little power and those who have some power and energy and will to act. If you pay attention, I don't know what page it is. I I can tell you. Is this the Bible we have in the pews? Is this the same one? If you want to go to page uh, three in the New Testament, which is about three quarters of the way back in the Bible, go to page three. Down in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see a big five. We're going to open our Bibles today. Next thing you know, we're going to be putting our hands up over our head. Okay, now I've got to find my spot. Okay, so the, the first three blessings the env- or enviables name the reality of suffering in their midst, the poor in spirit, spiritual oppression, loss and grief, the forced acceptance of their place in society, and the life-giving comfort of the true, that the true kingdom will offer them. Those first three blessings name that pain. And the next blessings 
describe what will happen when the power shifts. In the kingdom of heaven, those who are looked up to, the blessed, the enviable, they will hunger and thirst for righteousness, not for power and wealth. Those who are enviable, blessed, looked up to will be merciful, not ruthless. They will be pure in heart rather than greedy and power hungry. They will be peacemakers, not colonized warriors. And if they are persecuted, if they are persecuted, it will be for their struggle for righteousness, not for their skin diseases, their gender, or their social caste. Jesus is speaking to people who have been robbed of all power, all autonomy, all hard-won resources. Among them are those who have only the strength to drink in these words of hope and promise. Also among them are those who are ready to fish for people and advance the kingdom. And in that way, this gathered crowd is not so unlike us. We can't see the world from our vantage point halfway up the bluff, but we can see it from our phones and our computers and our newspapers. And we don't need to cast our gaze very far to see suffering, hunger, want, abuse of power, neglect, or warmongering. Today, we Trinity do a courageous thing. We open our doors to our neighbors in a new way. People who are just like us. In fact, I hesitate to use the word us because it sounds like there's something other than us. But these are people, our neighbors, these are us who are experiencing homelessness. People who have been cast into the shadow lands by systems over which they have no control. People hesitant to come in because they feel blamed for their plight. Blamed when we know that two-thirds of bankruptcies are due to health care costs. Blamed when in Washington County, for a family of five, if both adults are working full-time at minimum wage, they're trying to live on $40,000 a year without benefits, without paid time off or parental leave. Jesus names realities that are just as specific, just as real to his hearers. Jesus is also speaking to our neighbors experiencing homelessness, and Jesus is speaking to those among us this morning who hunger for righteousness on those, beha- those struggling to survive. But Jesus is also speaking to those of you here that are struggling to survive, who for whatever reason are hoping to make it through this day, you who are wounded and burdened financially, spiritually, emotionally, physically. Jesus is speaking to you too. Later on in Matthew, Jesus will quote Leviticus, and don't switch the slide just yet. I'll tell you when. Jesus will, please, uh, Jesus will quote Leviticus when he says that the greatest commandment is this, to love your neighbor as yourself. My sweet dad often puzzled over this commandment. He would say to me, sis, How do we love our neighbor if we don't love ourselves to begin with? And how many of us really even love ourselves to begin with? And my dad is right. Self-love, self-compassion is critical for us to find the power and the strength and the will to love our neighbor. We can't give from emptiness. But in that quote from Leviticus, did you know that the word as in Hebrew is the exact same thing as an equal sign? So you can put love your neighbor equals loving yourself. They're the same. One doesn't exist without the other. They are the same. Jesus starts with you. Blessed are you who are poor in spirit, who are sad, empty, hungry, lost, lonely. Blessed are you who mourn, who grieve a loved one, a bygone way of life, a sense of purpose. Blessed are the meek, you who have little strength to face the day, you who have been robbed of your sense of self and purpose and dignity. You are the kingdom of heaven. You will find comfort. You will be made whole. You will know abundance of life. God sees you, knows you, loves you. The pain And the loss that you feel now is not your only truth. It is not even the most 
It is not even the most powerful truth. It's just part of the truth. Jesus masterfully includes everyone in this list of blessing. You who ache for healing and you who long to be healing. Jesus offers both balm and boldness. Jesus nourishes the poor in spirit and offers nourishment for the eager and the spirited who are ready for the long upending work of the kingdom of God. Jesus invites us to full participation in the kingdom of God regardless of our capacity, our energy, our situation as those who give and receive. This morning, later in the service, as you greet one another, try a courageous thing. Call one another blessed. And not in the hashtag blessed way of pop culture, but in the tender way of acknowledging the unique place you each occupy as Jesus blessed on the mountainside. Let your greeting offer both solace and encouragement and each receive from that blessing what you need most to hear, knowing that we are all part of the same kingdom of hope and life and light. Rejoice and be glad. Amen.